we're back. And, and, and now something has changed. Uh, for one thing, I feel comfortable sitting, which I didn't before, except for this part here. Uh, we now have something special, and that something special is shared common experience in the past. Even though the past was only 15 minutes ago, the fact that we went away and came back bonds us in a certain sense. And because we are now all close personal friends, um, I want to make a special point of giving you an offer as a friend. I, I, I make this offer to all my friends. Um, you're professional writers, and I'm here to help you. And my help is concrete. Sometime in your career, as we go forward from here, you might have a question you think I can answer or a problem I can help you solve. Uh, before you leave, take my card so you will have my email address. And then I invite you to email me anytime, five minutes, five days, five years from now. Email me and ask for my help. Here's my promise to you. I will help you in any way I can to the limit of my ability so long as it doesn't take more than five minutes and I don't have to leave my desk. As it turns out, there's quite a lot I can accomplish in five minutes sitting at my desk. So feel free. This is a, an honest offer. It's kind of my way of, um, well, two things, honoring my commitment to being a good teacher and also continuing my mission to submit the entire world to my domination. <laughs> because I always say when I teach, I have two jobs. I have my text and my subtext. And whatever the text is, the subtext is always the same. Get them hooked on the drug that is John Vorhaus. Oh. So uh, insofar as you find yourself falling under my magical spell, that's a good thing. Keep doing that. It's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for all of us. But the offer is real. Because we have spent time together, I am your friend. And as your friend, I will help you if I can. OK? Are there any questions or issues from what we talked about earlier that you might like to follow up on? If not, I'm going to go ahead and jump into comic story. There are a couple of major points that I want to convey here. One is I want to give you a sense of the different types of comic stories that are available to you. And the other is I want to give you some real simple and effective tools for thinking about how to construct a story at its most fundamental level. Uh, who said you, you, you were at UCLA Extension? No, who was at UCLA? Somebody's, oh, she left. Good, that's fine. I don't feel rejected, not at all. Um, somebody's here who, who studied where I taught some 20, 30 years ago. And uh, I undertook to teach at UCLA. I specifically taught story structure because I didn't understand it. And it has been a practice in my life. When there's something that I want to learn how to do, I find someone to pay me to teach it. Uh, that's a really, really good strategy. It served me quite well. The only problem is um, this includes things like sailing and archery, <laughs> which are two dangerous things to teach if you don't know how to do them. But story in particular is something that gave me, gives me a lot of trouble, and I think gives a lot of people a lot of trouble. So I, I try to think about story in simple terms, and I try to help others think about story in simple terms. So this is what we're going to talk about in the next hour or so. We'll leave some time at the end for question, answer, dialogue, discussion. Um, also, it's been pointed out to me that some people are feeling a little self-conscious about communicating if your English isn't so strong. Just consider what a douche I am for not speaking any Spanish at all. And, and feel comfortable speaking, collaborating. We're all here together. Nobody's judging anybody. And don't feel self-conscious about not contributing. Certainly don't worry about how I feel. I, I hear this. A lot. People say, you have to understand this about the, and then you can fill in the blank, the Czechs, the Norwegians, the Swiss, the Germans. Everybody says, you have to understand this about us. We're very shy. We don't ask questions. We don't talk. Everybody's like this, except the Americans, because 
in our arrogance, we think the world owes us everything, and we're not ashamed to take it. So, but um, don't, don't feel as though I'm suffering if you're not communicating. I get paid either way. So, uh, comic opposites. We were talking about comic characters, and I'd like to make a transition from comic characters into comic storytelling by using this type of comic story. It's possible to think about telling a situation comedy or a film story or a novel simply based on the proposition of taking two characters who have opposing points of view and putting them to war against each other. The simple structure for this is create a character, assign a strong comic filter, think of the opposite comic filter, create a character who has that filter, and tie them together tightly. And once you put them together, you will create the following situation. Two characters who are slaves to their comic filters with a desperate need to change each other's minds. And that desperate need to change each other's minds is the stuff that drives the story. <coughs> Give you an example. This is for a situation comedy. He's a cop, she's a crook. Together they are law and disorder. <coughs> He's a cop. What's his comic filter? Seriousness. Seriousness. What else? Respect the law. Respect the law. I like to put it the rules rule. She's a crook. She's a criminal. She's a uh, con artist. What's the Spanish for con artist? Yeah. What is it again? Okay, beautiful words. I won't remember them, but they sound great. <laughs> By the way, I've written three novels about con artists. In addition to everything else, I've written three novels just about con artists, which raises the question, am I a con artist? <laughs> I have been asked that question. I will tell you um, uh, that I am a trustworthy liar, and you can take that for what you, what you wish. Uh, what is the comic perspective of a, of a criminal, of a con artist? Break the law. So now we have an irreducible conflict between follow the rules and break the rules. And this is a great sturdy foundation, especially for a situation comedy, because it creates the possibility of many, many, many battles. And the show, the episodes amount to a series of battles within a war. The ultimate war is a war for the, the right to be right. If I'm a law breaker and you're a law follower, I have one job, and that's to change your mind. And if you're a really, really strong rule follower, the when I succeed in breaking you and changing your mind, I win a profound victory. We talked earlier about comic filter and the relationship between comic filter and reality. The comic filter shapes the character's reality. At the same time, the character is trying very hard to make reality agree with his opinion. If I'm someone who follows the rules, I want everyone to follow the rules. I want society to be orderly and, and um, rational. I want things to be safe and within the law. But mostly I want to change her mind. Because if I can change her mind, it's like changing everybody's mind. I can't change everybody's mind, but if I can change the mind of the person who disagrees with me the most, then I win. Unfortunately for me, I'm sitting across the table from a woman who has the opposite point of view. The rules are made to be broken. I must destroy the rules. I have to break society. And I want all of society to agree with me that chaos is best. I can't get all of society to agree with me, but there's my worst enemy sitting right across the table from me. And if I can get him to break the rules, I win a profound victory. Again, we think about inner conflict. I like him. Might even want to fuck him. But first, I have to change him. 
So my desire for him fights against my need to change his way of thinking. That's a big problem for a character. It's a great setup for a situation comedy. It will also work as a movie. The only difference is that in a movie, there's a resolution. The resolution is exactly this. Comic opposites meet in the middle. At the end of a movie that's based on the proposition, uh, based on the premise of different people fighting over whose reality gets to be right, the ending will always be the same, an accommodation, a union of those two ideas. Can you think of a movie that follows this structure? Neither can I. I don't even know why I brought it up. Doesn't seem to make sense to me now. Sorry, Lethal Weapon, thank you, from the book, sure. You have a, um, a, a cop who does everything by the book and a, and a cop who's a rebel, rule follower versus rule breaker. They reach an accommodation, they become a team. They realize that a better strategy is to sometimes follow the rules and sometimes break the rules. That's the compromise. This is where comic opposites meet in the middle. They meet so effectively that we have, what, four, five lethal weapon movies? So that's a setup that works. Yes, sir. Does this situation fit with uh, unresolved sexual tension? Oh, uh, microphone, microphone. Who has coming? Situation does this? I we don't need it. With unresolved <coughs> sexual tension. Does the situation need unresolved? No, uh, fit. Fit with unresolved. Unresolved sexual tension absolutely drives the bus straight over a cliff. If you have two characters who don't agree with each other and want to be together, each of those characters has strong inner conflict. In the example that we're talking about, let's just flesh it out. He's a policeman. Maybe he's an undercover detective, and he catches her in the act of committing a crime. But because he's sexually attracted to her, for some crazy reason, he says, instead of throwing you in jail, I'm going to take you home with me and train you and teach you to follow the rules. I'm going to adopt you like a pet. Really, I just want to screw you. And probably you're only coming with me because you want to screw me too. But neither of us can give in to the sexual tension without surrendering our power. Because if I, if I sleep with you and still let you think it's okay to be a crook, a bad person, I lose. First, I have to convince you to think my way. Then we can sleep together. So the, the sexual tension is created by the barrier of the conflicting comic filters. The, the, the war must be fought before the sex can happen. And the longer the war goes on, the more unresolved sexual tension there is. Now, this idea of sexual tension can be thought of in a more abstract way. Let's imagine that there are uh, two best friends. 60-year-old um, guys like me. One's gay, one's straight. The straight one's wife just died. And now, for some reason, they're living together. The, the gay character's comic filter is not be gay. It's be free. The straight character's filter is not be straight. It's be tied, be committed. Follow the rules again. There is the possibility for them to live in harmony, for them to resolve their not sexual tension, but their friendship tension. They could become close friends. They could meet in the middle. But again, those comic filters, here's my lifestyle, and I have to convince you that it's right. Oh, yeah, well, here's my lifestyle, and I have to convince you that it's right. They cannot have a truly harmonious relationship as long as their comic filters stand between them and block them. And that creates not sexual tension, but inner conflict. I really just want to put my arm around him and tell him I love him, man to man. But he's so screwed up about his relationship, about his attitude toward men and women, that I can't do it. I can't give him my heart until I fix his head. And then meanwhile, the other character is thinking the same thing. I, this guy is, is crazy and wrong. He shouldn't be doing what he's doing. He's my best friend. I want to tell him I love him, but I don't approve of him. 
So again, I want to give him his heart, my heart, but I can't until I fix his head. That's inner conflict. I've never really thought about it this way, but if we can take the sexual out of sexual tension and just think of it as inner tension, then we can imagine that wherever there are comic opposites, there will be inner tension for just this reason. I want us to be close, but comic filters keep us far apart. Our war for worldview, our war to be right, keeps us from getting together. Now, in a situation comedy, is it okay for me to talk about sitcom? I, 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 I don't know if many of you are sitcom writers, but it's a world I know very well. And um, who knows? You might find yourself in a position to be writing a sitcom someday. It'll be useful to know. It's useful to think of a situation comedy as a series of battles within a war. And the important thing to remember about these battles is they're big enough to matter, but small enough not to change the balance of power. Big enough to matter, but small enough not to change the balance of power. I'll give you an example. Um, and I was just thinking about this as an idea for a sitcom yesterday. I was in a, in a corner cafe here in Barcelona because all of your restaurants were closed at 4 in the afternoon when I wanted to eat something. Mm -hmm. But the snack bar was open. And it was, a, it was a, a, I think, a fairly common kind of space. There was a, a bar with a coffee machine behind. And then over here on the side, there was a window that opened up as a pass-through to the street outside where there were some tables. You, can you imagine this? Well, let, let's see if we can look at it visually. Here's the first set. That's the interior where the, the bar is. Then there's an a invisible wall with a pass-through window. And then here out here, we have outside seating. And that's the entire um, plan, plan, of the sitcom, just those two sets. But now let's populate the world. Um, uh, the bartender, he's tall, he's handsome. What's his comic filter? He's awesome. hmm? Business, is that what you said? This is, this is a place of business. We're here to do business, no monkey business. Okay, now here's a waitress serving the tables outside handing the trays through the window, talking to the bartender or the business owner through the window. His name is? John. Sure, why not? And her name is Linda, for no particular reason. What's her comic filter? What's the opposite of business? She's a flirt. Hmm? She's a flirt. She's a flirt. Flirt is not exactly the opposite. I think the opposite of business is pleasure. So I would say he's all business and she's all fun. They're going to fight about everything, right? If there's a customer who's not paying his bill, who thinks the customer should pay his bill? He does. Who thinks the customer should uh, be allowed to make a drawing instead? She does. And they're going to fight about that. Or taxes, or police, or their mothers, or his mother, or her mother, people they date, everything. They will fight about these things because each has a passionate need to prove the other wrong. So far, so good, right? So now, when we're thinking about stories to tell within this world, we're looking for something in particular, something that will be a good, juicy fight that can be resolved in some sense, but still leave them at war with one another. Um, we'll add some sexual tension, because there always is. So I'm just making this up off the top of my head, but let's imagine that he starts dating a girl he thinks is perfect for her, for him. And she's perfect because she's just like him. She's all business. Can you picture her in your mind? Let's give her a name. Martha. Marta. Okay. How is she dressed? What does she look like? Like a, an executive with a, a power suit and no-nonsense shoes, perfectly matched, makeup, hair, everything. No nonsense, right? She's perfect for him because she's just like him. That's what he thinks. What does Linda think? That's the, that's, that's the worst person in the world for you, for you because she'll take everything that's wrong about you and reinforce it. And you'll just end up being that much more wrong. And as your friend, I can't allow that. Now, what's her inner conflict? Gosh. 
I know that woman is wrong for him, and I want to tell him that she's wrong for him, but if I do that, am I really just doing it because I secretly like him? Am I doing it because he'll think I secretly like him? Now I'm a mess. I need to fix this problem, but I cannot fix this problem. He might think I'm jealous. I'm sorry? He it, might think I'm jealous. He might think I'm jealous. That's, that's my inner conflict right there. His, that's the wrong woman for him to date. I'll do him a big favor by not letting her get him. But if I do that, he'll think I'm jealous. Therefore, he'll think I love him, which is impossible because he's such an idiot. Right? Oh, rich inner conflict here. How does this story end? We know how it ends. I'm sorry? Well, these two, in the long run, they do. But this episode, how does this episode end? And? And she, well, she either succeeds or she fails. She tries to break him up, and she succeeds. Why? Because she's the wrong per that, that gal, Marta, that's the wrong person for him. Now, John can say, uh, I still think business rules. I still think business is right. Business is the thing that matters. But in this one case, I will make an exception. Maybe you're right. Maybe she's not exactly right for me. I will surrender a little bit of my worldview in this one small, tightly controlled area where it is safe. A, a great way to think about this is this is a joke that, that uh, uh, makes fun of the relationship, well, makes fun of married men. Okay? This is the way a married man stands his ground in front of his wife. See this line? Okay. See this line? Okay, see this line? Constantly in retreat. This is kind of what happens in these stories. I will never change, ever, except in this small way. And then in the next episode, I will never change, ever, except in this small way. Now let's turn it around. Let's give her a story. She gets a job, like she's offered a straight job. How does she feel about that? Inner conflict, probably. Why? She wants the job, but she hates the job. I want the job because it's more money. It's, it's the kind of road to success that everybody around me says I should have, including John, by the way. But, but if I take the job, first of all, there's a danger that I'll become a straight person, which I never want to do. And I don't mean straight in a sexual sense. I mean in a social sense. I'll become a dull normal. But also, if I take that job, it's going to take me out of this environment. And it's not that I love him. It's that I haven't finished fixing him. I have to finish fixing him before I can leave. Let's look at it from his point of view. What two ideas is he fighting with inside his head? He thinks she uh, should take the job, but at the same time, she, does, she doesn't want to. Right. I want you to go for your own good. But I don't want you to leave because I will miss you and I secretly love you. And so the more he tries to help her, the more he hurts himself. And the more he tries to hurt her, well, the more he helps himself, the more he hurts her. Again, here's our theme, inner conflict. The thing that is driving the story is the unresolved inner conflict of the characters. And look what it's based on, their fundamental nature, their comic filters. This is why I say, if you have two strong points of view, and you can make them fight, you have a sitcom, or a comic rom a rom romantic comedy, or a novel. You have a lot of room to move simply based on this. You also have a structure you can trust because you know how the story will go. If it's a sitcom, it's going to be a small battle within a larger war. And if it's a movie or other form of narrative, it will be a gradual uh, approach toward the middle and ultimately a compromise that satisfies them both. I don't know about you, but I hate starting a story. I hate starting to write any story because I don't know what the end is. And I'm afraid I will never find an ending that works. With this kind of structural information to stand on, I don't have to worry about that. I know what the story is going to be. I know that she's not going to quit and take that job. Well, she might, 
but only for a scene or two, and she'll come back in the end to work here. Oh, I know how this small episode is going to resolve, and I know how the whole thing is going to resolve in the end. Yeah, they're going to fall in love. We hope it will take them 10 seasons <laughs> so that we can do a lot of work, get paid over and over again, basically for telling the same story over and over again. It is this simple. It's this clean. And, and if you come away from our time here together with this understanding that just like comedy is made easier with comic tools, story is made easier with simple story structure, easy to understand structures. Everybody with me so far? Okay, let's play another game. Uh, now, in the comedy version of this moment, someone has come along and replaced my whiteboard marker with a permanent marker. That's called a practical joke. See chapter 9. <laughs> I'm going to show you a structure that is called center and eccentrics. And the proposition here is that you can build a story by thinking about a central character and then thinking about five or six characters who are designed, like laboratory designed, to give that character the worst possible time. Comic opposite says, here's a point of view and here's an enemy point of view, and they fight against each other. Center and eccentrics proposes, here's a central point of view, and here are a lot of enemy point of views arranged around the central point of view trying to fight against it. I did a situation comedy in, in uh, Romania called Voce, V-O-C-E-A, The Voice. The, this is the story of a a formerly radical newspaper that has now become a gossip newspaper. Can you, um, like, back in the time of the revolution, it stood up to power, it told the truth to power, and served the revolution. Now, 20 years later, it's a rag. And into this world comes our hero, and her name is Anna. And her comic filter is, I can do it. I can do it. She just graduated from journalism school. She's idealistic. She's young. She's strong. She's, um, uh, she'll stop at nothing to achieve her goal. What is her goal? Tell the, Tell the truth. Tell the truth. I'm going to speak the truth to power. I'm going to make Vocha the newspaper. It should have been, and it was back when I admired it, or it was back in, in the day. I'll give you one character, and then you guys can make up the rest. Character is the editor. And his name is, I don't know, Eon. And he's been around for 20 years. He was there in the beginning. He's here now. He's tired. He's cynical. He's seen it all. He's done it all. His attitude is, why do it? Can you see how I can do it? We'll fight against why do it. What does an episode of that show look like? Just between these two, maybe she gets a chance to interview the fallen dictator. Uh, uh, he's come back from exile. No one has seen him or talked to him in 20 years, but I can do it. I can get an interview with him. I can speak the truth. His attitude, you know what? He already stole all the money he needs to steal. He already bought all the judges he needs to buy. You're fighting a fight you cannot win and a fight that there's just no point in fighting. No, she says, I can do it, and she will set out to do it, and that's the story. Okay, this is an example of how we find story by exploring a line of conflict. There is a line of conflict that exists between these two characters, and across that line of conflict, we can tell lots and lots of different kinds of stories. What other characters can we put into this world that would give I can do it the worst possible time? Anybody? No, you can't. No, you can't. And we'll call this guy Danny. And his attitude is no, you can't. What's the line of conflict between them? It's right there, isn't it? I can do it versus no, you can't. Who else can we put into this world? You shouldn't. 
oh, you, you should not do it. Don't do it. You shouldn't do it. And we'll call this person Gary for no apparent reason. And again, we see a line of conflict. Now, all of these characters can have a role in and an opinion on the story at hand. But we'll always know what any of them is going to do based on their comic filter. As I said earlier, the comic filter predicts action. It predicts humor. Here, we know the attitudes of the characters. We know, because we know the attitudes of the characters, we know what actions will, they will take that will be consistent with their championing of their point of view. Every character wants their point of view to be the point of view that wins. What other characters can we bring into this world? You won't do it. I'm sorry? You won't do it. You won't do it. I'm going to hold off on that because it feels a little bit like you can't do it. Yes? If you want to do it, you need to pay. If you want to do it, you need to pay? <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by that. I mean, Oh, okay. All right. That's not exactly what I'm looking for. It's cool. What do you have? Uh, they are going to lie to you. No, that's not it. No, I can do it. I can do it. Thank you. No, I can do it. And this is a rival. And her name is Sheila. For no apparent reason. She says... Anna says, I can do it. Sheila says, no, I can do it. And we're going to fight about that. Anna shows up for the interview and finds that Sheila got there first and used her outthrust bosom to get in the door. There's one more character I'm looking for here. It's a special character. Every good sitcom has at least one. Friends has two. And those two are Joey and Phoebe. I'm looking for a fool. What is the fool's attitude? What is it? I can't help you do it. I can't fight you for doing it. I can't prevent you from doing it because I don't know what it is. Every good sitcom has a fool. The fool has a very special role in situation comedy. Well, in comedy. Fools and assholes can do two things that no other character can do. No, fools and assholes are two characters who can do one thing that no other character can do. What is that thing? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Exactly. Why can the asshole tell the truth? He doesn't give a damn. Why can the fool tell the truth? Because so long is the truth. Sorry? Because he doesn't... Right. He, he doesn't know the rules. Again, revisiting a, a funeral, there's a dead guy. Everybody hated him. Everybody knows he was a terrible person. Everybody is acting appropriately. Only two people there will tell the truth about the dead. The asshole, who doesn't care about breaking the rules or the norms, and the fool, who doesn't recognize the fool, the rules, or the norms. The fool can be thought of as having a childlike perspective or an alien perspective. The alien perspective is especially useful. Are you getting cold? Cold? Cold over here? You okay? Yeah? Because right. so I can help you out. I control the temperature here. Well, theoretically. Um, the fool who doesn't know the rules can tell the truth, can create a lot of comedy. That's just a generally useful character. But notice what we have here. No matter what the proposition is, Anna has forces of opposition surrounding her that will put tons of story pressure upon her. Uh, it can be everything from interviewing the dictator to going on a date to what else? Somebody, give me a situation. For a reporter in a newspaper, give me a situation. I'm sorry? To write a fake story? Yeah. Is that what you said? Whoa. Oh, I like that. I'm not exactly sure how to use it, but um, l let's just say Anna discovers that Sheila has written a story that's not true. 
What is her inner conflict? She wants to expose Sheila because it's the right thing to do, but she doesn't want to expose Sheila because this is a member of her family, her work family. So she has conflict. How will she resolve it? Well, we don't need to know how she will resolve it. What will the other characters' attitudes about this be? Uh, this is where you get, um, you can do it, but you must pay. And I think that's, that's kind of buried in this attitude here. She goes to the boss and says, that story is completely false. And the boss says, so? What the heck? Yeah. It's good. It's a, it's a good story. It'll sell a lot of copies. Uh, it's scandalous. That's what I like. In this day and age, who needs the truth? Anna does. So he goes to Gary, says, I'm going to take this upstairs. I'm going to take this all the way to uh, the head of the international newspaper syndicate thing. Gary says, you shouldn't do it. Why? Why? What happens if you do it? Maybe they'll, th oh, thank you. I was going to say, um, they'll fire you. But he says, they'll close the paper. And then, yeah, you succeed in punishing Sheila, but you also punish everybody else, including yourself, which I don't really care about, but also including me, which I care a lot about. Sorry, I have a bra strap problem. I, I never, ever had this problem before. The, the wire was creeping down my... Ah, I suddenly have empathy for women that I've never really experienced before. <laughs> Can't wait to tell my wife that. Everything was going fine, honey, until I had a bra strap problem. <laughs> um, well, we can map the characters' reactions all the way around. Here's what I want you to think about. Tonight, when you get home, and you're asking yourself, how can I use the information that I got today? Maybe spend five or 10 minutes with one of these. Find a character, assign a point of view. Ask yourself, what five different points of view would give that character a really, really bad time? It, you can do this exercise five times in the space of one beer. <laughs> I've done it. Sometimes it takes two beers, three, six, 10. But it's a really easy and fun exercise. And why it's easy and fun is it's so simple, you can't get it wrong. And because you get it right, you get kind of a rush. Like, oh man, I took nothing and turned it into this really great story full of all these rich lines of conflict, a world that I can easily explore, and I didn't have to write 20 words. I, I, maybe there's 20 words there. Most people's approaches to inventing story is to write a lot of words, and that is tedious and not fun. I prefer to write a few words that are very economical, that give me a lot of information for very little effort. In fact, if you want to think about your writing process, look for strategies that give you a lot of information for a little bit of effort. That's a much better strategy than its opposite, something that gives you very little information for a lot of effort. I can demonstrate this. It's called getting lost in detail. As you can see, there's very little detail here. And because there's very little detail here, it's easy to see the abstract structure underneath. But suppose I try to start the story this way. Anna is walking down the street. She's going to work. Her first day of work at Vocha, the people's newspaper from the past. She's wearing a lemon yellow blazer and a flared white skirt. Green pumps. Well, hang on a second. Yellow, green, not sure those go together. Okay, yellow blazer, yellow shoes. All right, she's walking to work in yellow blazer and yellow high heels. No, she's a practical girl. She's probably going to wear sneakers to work and then change into her work shoes when she gets here. Okay, she's walking down. She's wearing the yellow blazer, the sneakers, the skirt, the thing. Uh, it's raining. No, it's not raining. It's sunny. No, it's partly cloudy. No, it was raining earlier, so she has an umbrella, but now she doesn't need it. You can see I am lost in detail that doesn't matter. 
I'm not thinking about the story, I'm thinking about the events. I'm not thinking about the story, I'm thinking about the logistics, the plot mechanics. The secret to understanding story at its beginning, when you're just trying to bring it to life, is to operate on the lowest possible level of concrete detail. I can give it to you in the form of a guideline. The correct level of detail for any level of story development is always and exactly the minimum amount of detail necessary to give you enough information to know what will happen next. She walks into her new place of work and immediately her boss calls her an idiot. Now we're in the middle of a story. Now we're off and running. The details about what the boss looks like, what she looks like, none of that matters. Be minimal, sparing with your detail, and you will accelerate your pace of story development. Okay, so this is a type of story called center and eccentrics. It is hugely effective in situation comedy. Can you think of a successful situation comedy built on this structure? We've already mentioned it several times, though you might not think of it as that. It's Big Bang Theory. Who's the central character in the Big Bang Theory? Not Sheldon. Leonard. Why Leonard? He's the normal guy. Exactly. Uh, center and eccentrics proposes a normal character surrounded by crazy characters. The central character is the audience's window on the world. The audience goes into the story through the normal character. The proposition to the audience is, I invite you into my world. Come into the world, see it through my eyes, and you will have a great story and a wonderful time, I promise. I'm thinking right now about Scrubs, which is not, he's not exactly a normal character, but he has two qualities that the other characters don't have. A heightened level of self-awareness and a heightened level of articulation. He can see things and feel things better than the characters around him, and he can talk about things and explain things better than the characters around him. He becomes the emotional anchor for everyone around him. And for sure, this is what will happen with Anna. She will become the emotional, the mother, in a sense, to everyone around her, because she is the one who has enough self-awareness and emotional intelligence to help the others solve their problems. Now, it happens that Big Bang Theory is not just center and eccentrics, it's also comic opposites. Several comic opposites. Sheldon versus Leonard, Leonard versus Penny, Sheldon versus Penny. There are lots and lots of different lines of conflict. If you are designing serial story, something that is intended to last for a long, long time, you want to pack as many lines of conflict into the, if you will, into the DNA of the material so that you can be confident from the outset that there's plenty of stories to be told. In Hollywood terms, this is called, uh, it asks the question, does this idea have legs? Does it have enough conflict built into it that we can reliably predict that it will uh, last a long, long time. The beauty, the genius of a show like uh, The Big Bang Theory is that it has not only all the stories of center and eccentrics, but also all the stories of comic opposites, and then all the stories of other comic opposites. Uh, Kutrapali versus um, um, Howard, Howard versus his mother, Howard versus Penny. If you start drawing lines of conflict for this kind of show, pretty soon you get just blank space, black space, because there are so many lines of conflict. And by the way, we're speaking of a particular genius by the name of Chuck Lorre, who also gave us Two and a Half Men, which is straight up and down, comic opposites. Completely straightforward. A neurotic nerd versus a, a self-confident uh, playboy, we could say. Straight versus bent. Conservative versus liberal. This is what you're looking for. Uh, irreducible conflict between characters. Okay, everybody with me on this? Uh, yes. 
What you said about the Big Bang Theory, isn't it always like that, that uh, center and eccentrics? I mean, Anna, isn't it uh, comic opposites of to all these characters? Uh, you can say that. You can look at it that, that way. She is, uh, there are lines of comic opposition between Anna and all the characters. Uh, just for fun, let's say that Anna starts this job on the same day as Bruce, and his attitude is, um, uh, yeah, what's left here? You can't, no, you can't. Um, why do it? What did you say? You had one before. Um, it'll cost you. It'll cost you. And the two of them start on the same day, and they're competing for the same job. Let's just make their bad situation worse and say that they're both hired on a six-month probation, and only one of them will stay after six months. And let's make the situation worse by making them extremely hot for each other. Obviously, if they met under any other circumstances, they would go to bed together immediately. But they can't do it now because they're fighting an emotional war and a practical war, and neither can afford to surrender at all. So now you end up with Anna and Bruce as fundamental central comic opposites, and then the two of them surrounded by characters who give both of them a bad time. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Talking about mom? Yeah. Yep. Uh, that would be just a strange couple sitcom or also centric and eccentric no. because they don't play too much. It's uh, another Chuck Lorre sitcom, yeah. by the way. Uh, comic opposites, mother versus daughter, center and eccentrics. Think about the two of them as a double star. They are in orbit around each other, and then the other characters are planets in orbit around this, this uh, mutual uh, mass. So it's Bonnie versus Christy, but also Bonnie and Christy versus all of the other characters, and also all of the characters together against something else. What is the something else? Alcoholism. So now, or alcohol, yeah. So now we have a type of story called ensemble, which is the story of a group of characters fighting against a common enemy. In this case, they're fighting against relapse. They're fighting against their disease. And even though they have conflict about everything from whether to fight the disease to how to fight the disease, they also have unity in the fact that they are all committed to fighting the disease together. Can you think of other stories uh, where you have a group of people united against a common enemy? <coughs> Star Wars. <laughs> MASH. Is another good example. Other examples? Shameless. Sorry? Shameless. No. shameless? Ooh. Yes, shameless. <coughs> it's the story of a, a, a bunch of really degenerate people who live in a family in poor circumstances on the south side of Chicago. Yes, what's the common enemy? Every fucking buddy else. <laughs> Everybody who's not a Gallagher is an enemy. And we could, we can, well, who's the emotional core? Who's the center of that show? The normal girl. The normal girl, right. Okay. What's her name? I don't know. I forgot it. So it's clearly a center and eccentrics, but it's also clearly ensemble. What this tells us is a show doesn't have to be just one thing, or a movie doesn't have to be just one thing. And I'm not really presenting you this information so that you can make sure something fits neatly in a box but just so that you can understand more easily what you have available to you. And I hadn't really thought about Mom up till now as, a, as an ensemble type show, but it is very much a group of people united against a common enemy. Let's go back and visit our uh, corner bar where he, he's all business and she's all pleasure, all fun. Um, who else might be in that world? Who else might we expect to find populating that world? Sorry? A drunkard? A drunkard? Uh huh. Who else? The owner. The owner. Uh huh. Who else? The, a customer? A neighbor? A lot of people who live in and thrive in this world, which is a family. What might be their common enemy? What are they fighting against? Hmm? Against this. 
They could all fight against a thief, but what does that represent? The outer world. Everybody except us is our enemy, and when the enemy attacks, we have to band together and stand together. Friends is an ensemble. What's the common enemy in friends? So, so close. They're actually fighting against being alone. They're fighting against aloneness. The, they come together and stay together for the sake of holding existential anxiety at bay, for the sake of uh, not having to do it alone. I'll be there for you, right? All right. Now, I want to move on. I want to talk about a story structure that works for dramatic story, film, uh, um, novels, narrative, the type of story we understand to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Not a sitcom, not a serial drama that goes on for week, from week to week. How do we understand a story with beginning, middle, and end in the simplest terms? The answer begins with this word, theme. Theme equals instruction. Now, in order to understand this notion of instruction in story, we have to work our way through a couple of layers. If I say to you, the purpose of story is to instruct, the purpose of your story is to teach other people how to behave, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What kind of emotional response or taboo do you have? Thank you. Who am I to tell other people what to do? If I can never get around that idea, if I can never remove the emotional taboo that keeps me from instructing other people what to do, I can't really tell an effective story. I don't have a structure to stand on. I don't know, what, I don't know where the story is going or why it's heading there. Or I know where it's going, but I'm afraid to go there because afraid, I'm afraid someone will say, who are you to tell me what to do? Anybody ever had this feeling? This self-consciousness, who am I to tell other people how to think, how to live their lives? Maybe it's easy for you to understand a teacher doesn't have that problem. I'm hired to do this job. Who am I to tell you how to make comedy? I'm the guy they paid too much money to to come here and teach you. That's who I am. That's where my authority comes from. But where do we as writers find our authority? Here's where. Who are you to tell other people what to do? You are a writer, you are a storyteller, and telling other people what to do is exactly and explicitly your job. If you're not telling other people what to do, you're not doing what a writer must do. In order to understand this, I have to use a cheap sound effect. Please bear with me. Since the dawn of time, 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 Man has used story to instruct. Story is designed to instruct. Storytellers tell other people's stories so they know how to behave. This is a shocking notion when you think about it, but it's easy to understand. There are only two kinds of people in the world, storytellers and everybody else. Storytellers stand in front of the fire and they say, hey, all of you out there in the darkness, here's what I know. If we work together and use tools, we can go across the hill and kill a mastodon and skin it and eat it and we don't die. That is story used for the purpose of instruction. In that same primitive space, the storyteller pulls a brand out of the fire and holds it up and he says, let me tell you the story of Prometheus. Prometheus brought fire down from the heaven, didn't treat it with respect, burned everything up, had a bad day. You people in the audience treat fire with respect. 
If you treat fire with respect, you will thrive. Oedipus, I love Oedipus. Killed his father, fucked his mother, poked his eyes out. That's a bad day. What is his lesson? Do not kill your father or sleep with your mother. If you do, you have to poke your eyes out and have a bad day. What is the pro-survival message that humanity derives from this story? A taboo against incest, among other things. A taboo against killing your father for something else. You can imagine those are two good rules for a society to live by. The storyteller instructs society for the sake of lifting the human condition. Nothing less than that. And this might be shocking to you to think about in the context of writing comedy, but these are exactly the stakes we're playing for. Look at mom. What is the instruction of mom? What? Fight your disease. Find people who will help you fight your disease. If you have a disease and you don't fight it, what happens? You die. And if society has a disease and doesn't fight it, what happens? Society dies. Now, this idea of story and theme, this relationship between instruction and theme, or between instruction and society, rather, can mean different things at different times. You can have a story in one culture at one time that says very clearly, fight authority. You can have another story in a very similar space and time that says, obey authority, cooperate with authority. Storytelling changes based on the needs of society. I don't want to get into the whole Catalonian independence thing because it's way outside of my, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's above my pay grade, let's say. <laughs> but I can certainly imagine people in this place and in this time having two urgent and conflicting needs. One need is to support unity, and the other need is to fight against unity or to break unity. And it's not my place to say that one theme is better than another. It is my place to say this. If you have a strong, clear theme, you have the structural skeleton you need to tell a story. If you don't have a strong, clear theme, you don't have that thing, and you won't have a strong story. So before we get into how this plays out on a structural level, I'd like you to do a little thought experiment with me. Let's start, start by asking ourselves, what are some common themes in storytelling? What sort of themes do we hear over and over again? Love. love. Find love. What else? Hmm? Support your family. Be, be true to your family. What else? Be your Sorry? Be yourself. Uh-huh. What else? Find the treasure. Find treasure. Huh. I love that one. Find treasure. Not because you get rich, but because you get to explore and you get to rise. What else? Honor. Sorry? Honor. Have honor. Live an honorable life. Uh, what's the theme of Don Quixote? What's Don Quixote. Uh, live your dreams. Hmm? Live your dreams. Live your dreams. Okay, that's a good one. Sorry? Dream, dream. It's right there in the song, right? It's right there in Dream Your Impossible Dream. I love it when they put it there in uh, the theme of Star Wars. Use the force. Couldn't be any clearer. It's right there. Um, what's the theme of the Bible? Like the New Testament, the story of Jesus. Mm, I think it's give yourself to God. Give yourself to God because then even if you die, you get to live forever. That's a pretty profound story. Not everybody buys it, but we can, we, we, um, there's no arguing that it has had a profound impact on the level of story. It has, a profound, has had a profound impact on society. So I'm asking you to, uh, first of all, recognize that a lot of these themes are very common in story. Uh, Find love no matter what is the theme of Romeo and Juliet, but also Shakespeare and love. Also West Side Story. A bunch of other stories we can think of. What's useful to know, note about this is don't worry if your theme doesn't sound new. It's not. Unless your theme is stop using Instagram all day. <laughs> then it might be new. Uh, or if it's very uh, localized or specific. But the grand themes, the fundamental themes of human experience are the same over and over again. We get the same themes. Now, 
Here comes the key question. What themes are important to you, not as a writer, but as a human being? Here's how I'd like you to think about it. Imagine that you have a magical power, and the magical power is this exactly. You have the magical power to open up the head of anybody or everybody, put a thought, a theme inside their heads, and be sure that it will stick. You have the power to change someone's mind or everybody's mind. If you had that sublime power to instruct, and you could only use it one time, what message would you communicate? What theme would you give? Take a moment, write it down. The theme of the translators is speak more slowly. <laughs> My theme is surf strange waves. Surf strange waves. Embrace adventure. If I could magically get inside your head and give you an idea and know that it's stuck, that's the theme I would give you. Embrace adventure. Surf strange waves. Why? Because the example of my life tells me you'll have a pretty good life, and I want you to have a good life because I'm empathetic. What's your theme? Be yourself. Be yourself. Anybody else say be yourself? It's very common. It's a common theme. What's your theme? Be a good person, okay? Good, solid. Um, it's a theme you can write to. Yeah. Listen. Listen. I'm sorry, did you say pay attention? <laughs> Listen. Who are you? I, I have to ask. Who, who are you speaking to right now? Your wife? Your child? The country. The country? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. I like that. Anybody else? Be courteous. Be courteous. courteous. That's a great one. Yeah? Don't be afraid to lose. Don't be afraid to lose. Wow, that's a great one for anybody who tries anything, right? Now, think about how you feel. The minute you start thinking about taking an idea that is precious to you and genuinely sharing it with other people, I can see it. Your, your answers are coming more easily. You're, 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 you are engaged in this question. I can feel it. Your minds are alive with the power of telling other people what to do. And now you have a reason for doing it. Because when you tell other people what to do, you are fulfilling the sublime job and obligation of a storyteller. But it gets even better. Because once you know what your theme is, you also know what your story is. And you know it from beginning to end. And as is my nature, I will present it to you in the form of a crudely drawn diagram. In its simplest form, in its most fundamental structure, a story is a hero's journey across an arc of change from denial to acceptance of the theme. It is the hero's journey, hero's journey from denial to acceptance of the theme. If you have a hero, which can be anybody, I don't mean a hero in the, in the Bilbo Baggins sense or in the Luke Skywalker sense, but just in the sense of somebody you want to listen. If you know the hero, which is an arbitrary choice, and you know the theme, which is your heartfelt creative ambition, then you know what the story is because the story will always be the same, the journey from denial to acceptance of the theme. Let's test it. The theme is listen. What do we know for sure about the hero when the story starts? Not listening. What do we know for sure about the hero at the end of the story? Listening. He goes on a journey from not listening to listening. This is such fundamental math. It works every time. Sorry, I'm getting excited. I always get excited about this because it's liberating. 
We try to write stories and we don't know where we're going. Now the map is there and the map is clear. We're always somewhere on the journey from denial to acceptance. I should mention, this is a certain type of story, a positive story, a happy ending story, which is to say a comic story or a comedy. In a comedy, the hero learns the lesson of the theme and is rewarded with community. In a tragedy, the hero fails to learn the lesson of the theme and is punished with exclusion. I'm not going to um, work too much on that distinction right now, but rather just focus on stories where the hero learns the theme. Why? Because this is where comedies live, and it's where uplifting stories live, and I'm a fan of both of those things. Let's test it. Uh, one or two more. What was your theme? Be yourself. Be yourself. Where does that story start? The hero, he lives in doubt that he should be himself. And where does it end up? Uh, yeah, he, certainty. Hmm? See, certainty. He goes from doubt to certainty. Should I be myself? I don't know. At the end of the story, I know I should be myself. We can predict from this that certain types of moments will emerge in the story. What events can we expect to happen on the road from denial to acceptance of the theme. What do we know will happen? Obstacles. obstacles. What kind of obstacles? All, All kinds. Yeah, that's. Uh, so, sorry? Character. Opposite character. Yeah. The first thing we're going to see is change. Why change? Why is the first story action going to be changed? Change of circumstance, change of state. Wise man who tells you to change. Yes, that's true. It's something I said before. The truth is revealed under pressure. Now we can look at that phrase and think of it in a different light. We talked earlier about how that pressure creates comedy. Now we can say that pressure also creates story. It starts the drive toward acceptance, and it propels and energizes the drive toward acceptance. Uh, my theme is embrace adventure, surf strange waves. Where, where does my hero start out? Not normal, just having a normal life. Um, if, if his circumstances don't change, that, well, let's put it this way. That's what today looks like. If his circumstances don't change, what does tomorrow look like? Exactly the same. Change creates pressure and requires that the character take action. This is why the first moment is a moment of change. Robert McKee, whose book is available out there, and by the way, shout out to my publisher, hello, Alba, um, for uh, their support for my Barcelona world tour, my one-stop world tour. Uh, they were kind enough to bring my books and also Robert McKee's wonderful book on story structure. McKee makes a point that I will now steal. He asks the question, what is different about today? The story always starts with something different about today. Otherwise, there's no need to change, there's no pressure, there's no story. So story starts with change. A character thinks, I don't need adventure in my life. Change happens and it could be a Call to adventure. Ah, this is The Hobbit, is it not? This is um, Bilbo Baggins saying, I'm fine living my life in the Shire with my furry toes, drinking my butter beer, and hanging out with my friends. Now there's a call to action. Change happens. What's different about today? 13 dwarves fall on his doorstep, and a wizard calls him on a quest. The, the subtitle of that book is There and Back Again. This is a character who goes from being at home to very far away from home and returning home, but returning home changed. The proposition at the start of the story is I don't need the world, I don't know the world, I don't care about the world. But because of all the pressure the character is put under, finding a ring, fighting Gollum, uh, betrayal, sword fights, flying dragons, all of these things put pressure on the character and force him to change. 
What other event, what event do we know for sure we're going to find at the end of the story? Learning, learning did you say? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to put it in this terms. Oh, sorry, you said learning. I'm, I'm going to call it a moment of truth. The moment when the change takes hold. The moment when the character says, all my life I've been wrong. Up till this moment I was wrong to think I don't need adventure or I don't need to listen or I don't need to love or I don't need to be myself. I was wrong. And in that moment, transformation takes place and the journey is complete. The character has completed his transformation from denial to acceptance of the theme simply by saying, in the moment of truth, I was wrong. My old way of thinking is gone. My new way of thinking is here. <laughs> what lies in between? I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, I was asking myself, how can it really boil down all the middle events of this story? And what they boil down to, according to my current understanding, is some bullshit. <laughs> events take place that bring the character closer and closer to the theme. And it's really, really easy to get bogged down in thinking about what those events are. But for our purposes, when we're just trying to put a story on its feet, this is enough. We have a hero. We have a theme. We have the beginning of the story in denial. We have a change of state. We have events, some bullshit, which amount to escalating pressure. Remember that the truth is revealed under pressure. New types of pressure are applied, usually a love interest, because a love interest will create inner conflict. Character's idea, old idea was, I just want things for myself. Now the character says, well, I want things for myself, but I want things for this other person as well. Now I'm fighting a war within. More pressure, more events, more bullshit. Finally, all of this pressure becomes unsupportable. Everything falls apart, and in an explosive moment, the character transforms from denial to acceptance of the theme. A few minutes ago, I showed you that map, uh, character map of the, the um, center and eccentrics. And I said, take this out to a bar and do it on a cocktail napkin and see what that looks like. I recommend that you do this exercise too. Because what will happen is you'll start out with no information about your story at all. Nothing but a name and a theme. And just by asking yourself what kind of change could take place, and what sort of moment of truth might be arrived at, just that tiny bit of thinking about your story will cause an explosion of information about your story. You'll go from having nothing to having too much in the space of a beer or two. It's my promise to you, and in fact, I challenge you to it. You go out, you bring this template with you, you buy yourself a beer, then if you don't experience revelation you send me a note, tell me I owe you a beer, and I will happily pay you that beer next time we meet. <laughs> so certain am I that this is a, a tool not just for storytelling, but profound liberation from the fear that under, underscores or uh, anchors every single writer's experience. This is where we die as writers. We start stories, something about them intrigue us, and we start writing, Next thing we know, we're lost. We don't know where we're going. Well, with this model to rely upon, you always know where you're going. You also have a great way of testing every single idea you have because you can ask of every thought that crosses your mind, does this put more pressure on the character? If the answer is yes, it belongs in the story. If the answer is no, it doesn't belong. And you can make editorial choices. You can make change easily and painlessly without suffering. See, I've used this word suffering a couple of times, and it kind of feels to me like my mission is to relieve your suffering. Whether that suffering is, uh, I fear I'm not funny, but I want to be funny, inner conflict. Or that suffering is, I'm passionately devoted to telling a story, but I don't know how. If I can relieve you of that doubt, that insecurity, I'm doing my job. I'm earning my ticket to heaven. And when I say to you that it's a writer's job to instruct, I'm manifesting it for you right now. I, I guarantee it. I'm, I shouldn't make this guarantee because maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong about this. We started out talking about comedy and writing jokes, and we covered a lot of good ground. 
But that stuff exists up here. The stuff we're talking about now exists down here in the fundamental structure of who we are as writers. And if I can get down there in your sub-basement and start shining some lights and helping you not be stuck in that space, I'm doing some good work. I'm doing worthwhile work. And I'm also reinforcing the point that it's a writer's job to instruct. As I instruct you that it's a writer's job to instruct, it's, again, it's kind of meta. I find it very exciting. I hope you do too. I also hope you don't find it too pretentious. But again, notice, I'm not really worried about that. I'm not worried about you saying, who the hell is this guy to tell me how to think about story? Why? Because I believe in my heart that I'm doing my job as a storyteller. But also, I know for sure from long experience as a writer that I'm making your job easier. And if you're not happy that somebody's come along and made your job easier, I don't think you're thinking about the right stuff, whether it's me or anybody else. I hate suffering in story. I don't understand story. Unless I break it down and present it to myself in terms I understand, that's what I get from this. Are there any questions about it? Yeah. La, a ver, el, el tema tiene que estar relacionado de alguna forma o tiene que ser lo mismo que el, que el comic eh, filter. Ah, that's a great ¿Qué, question. ¿Qué, qué relación hay? Uh, they, they lie right on top of each other. The theme and the comic filter are side by side. If you have a character whose theme is... Uh, Uh, sorry, if the theme of the story is embrace change, then you know you have a character who starts out, what? Resistant to change, which is not only his philosophical point of view, but also his comic filter. A great example of this is the movie Liar, Liar. Jim Carrey, uh, his comic filter is I always lie. The theme of the story is don't lie, tell the truth. And he goes from denial to acceptance of the theme. He stops being a liar, surrenders his comic filter, Uh, enters into a new version of himself, is reborn. And in being reborn, he completes his transformation, leaves his old comic filter. You might say that he stops being a comic character and becomes a real character, and I've never said that before, so I'm going to say it again. In the type of story we're talking about, authentic transformation, the character stops being a cartoon and starts being a real person. We can certainly find a lot of examples of that. Right now, I'm thinking of the, the film, My Best Friend's Wedding. What's the theme of My Best Friend's Wedding? I think it is love the one you're with, or love yourself, probably. Maybe. The character is hysterical, chasing a, a dream of love that is not true. Uh, her comic filter is impossible love can come true. At the end of the movie, She's a real person with a real understanding that love is not romance. Romance and love are not the same thing. That it's possible to have love with her best friend without having romance. So, yeah, she's transformed. She goes from fake to real. So, yeah. so in a certain way, um, the comic uh, filter is always denying the theme at the entrance of the story. I, I think it is. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms. And by the way, this is why I teach, because I learn. Because I can turn around and sell this to somebody else. <laughs> that the comic filter equals denial of the theme. And the story is complete when the comic filter is set down and replaced with a more uh, authentic understanding of reality. A false understanding of reality, as represented by the comic filter, is replaced by a true understanding of reality, as represented by the end of the story. Um, I see some people starting to give me some body language that kind of boils down to had enough learning now, <laughs> kind of ready to move on to whatever is next in my life. I myself am receiving strong signals from my ear that it's time to get this off and not um, have it on my head anymore. So why don't we go to take a couple of questions on this topic or any topic and then we'll wrap up in just the next couple of minutes, get everybody out of here. Any questions?
Hola, em volia fer una pregunta, però aprofito que tinc el micro per donar-te les gràcies d'aquesta classe tan amena i profitosa que ens has regalat aquesta tarda. I hi ha hagut un moment que m'ha semblat entendre que no treballes si no tens els... I'm sorry, I'm just going to go over here. I'm having a little trouble hearing. Go ahead, keep talking. Ah, que m'ha semblat entendre que no treballaves si no tenies els finals sense tenir un final del capítol o deixes que flueixi la història i que vingui aquest moment. No m'entén. Oh, that's a good idea, but I am literally not understanding your question. Que m'ha semblat entendre que deies un moment que... Yeah, go ahead. No treballaves fins que tenies el final del capítol. Has dit això? Ah, no, that's not right. And by chapter you mean story, right? You don't need to know the end of the story in order to write a story. In American slang, there are writers who are called pantsers, P-A-N-T-S-E-R-S. Pantsers, people who write by the seat of their pants. They make it up as they go along. When I write novels, I have an idea of the theme, but I write by the seat of my pants because I'm writing mysteries and I find that I can write mysteries more effectively if I don't know where they're going. If I know the end of the story, I often find either I'm not telling it effectively or I'm not interested in it. But I will say this, you cannot write for television or film without knowing the end of the story because television and film are structure-driven media. The, the types of stories that work through the eyes and ears of a person are different from the types of story that work through the eyes alone, through a novel. I would never try to write a screenplay, for example, without having a full and complete story outline to help me make the transition from outline to, uh, to script. But also, I would never go from story to script I would never write a story outline without a smaller document to tell me what the story outline is going to look like. And I would never write that smaller document without doing this work first so I know what the story is supposed to be about in general. So I think I answered yes and no to both those questions. Yeah. Um, by the way, thank you for thanking me. Let us also thank Paul and the GAC in general for, and our translators, of course, our interpreters, for all their wonderful work in supporting us. Please, can we give them a round of applause? <laughs>